Outlook for investors, uh, average sales in Florida have dropped from 162 to 118. Um, if, you're on, if you're a buyer, obviously that means you're, you're saving money by waiting, but it's, it's unclear that, that homes will, will continue to, uh, to, to rise at any point in, in the near future. And, and, and this is an important statistic if you take away this one number. Uh, according to the Wall Street Journal on Saturday, the banks have 107 months, let me repeat that, 107 months of inventory. That's called a, uh, a shadow inventory. Um, it's the amount of, of real estate that they uh, uh, have not necessarily put on the market yet, but that they have actually repossessed, that they now own. And they don't want to stick it all out there at one time because they know that if they did that, prices would drop like a tank. So they're, they're kind of bleeding it out. And um, based on current trends, you're looking at about 107 months worth of, worth of inventory. Um, that's 9.3 years the last time I, I checked, which would put us very close to 2019, by the way, which is kind of interesting how that works. Um, but there's a caveat to all this, and I want you to just remember this caveat, because in 2005 I gave a lecture, and the lecture was, when was the bubble going to burst? I think I gave that lecture in June. It's on the internet if you ever want to catch it. And I said that the thing we can never predict are unexpected events. And at that point, I gave a list of, of what those events could be that would bust the bubble. I talked about an oil spike, which actually was, was a, a precipitating cause. I talked about a natural disaster, which was a major precipitating cause. That was Hurricane Wilma that hit New Orleans. Was it Wilma? What hit New Orleans? Was it, excuse me? That was Katrina. But Wilma hit here, too. So we had Wilma here and Katrina. That was a double hit here in Florida. But Katrina is the one that really... Uh, uh, I think caused a, a major problem uh, in terms of the American psyche. And so uh, we also talked about man-made events, God forbid, that, 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 that could also happen. And so when you have um, un unknown events that, that can affect the market, they're typically ca called black swan events because they're so unusual. And one of the black swan events that could easily happen, and you hear the gold prognosticators, you know, the guys on the radio telling you to buy gold, buy gold, buy gold, because there's inflation that's coming. It's kind of funny. They keep talking about this inflation that's coming, yet the Federal Reserve today infused $600 billion into the economy today because the little secret is that we're actually in, in, def, in a deflationary period. Incomes are down, real estate prices are down, technology, equipment is down. I mean, there are a few things that are going up, but overall, you know, things are down, rents are down, and so when you add it all up, prices are actually going down, and that's not good for a growing economy. And so when these guys are saying you should be buying gold, you should be buying gold, they're saying you should be buying gold because Somewhere over the next turn or, or over the next hill or around the next bend, there's going to be some inflation, some hyperinflation. And at some point, someone's going to figure out that many countries, particularly developing countries, third world countries in South America, the way they would get out of debt is they would create this hyperinflation for a short period of time, which would allow all prices to rise. Well, if all prices rose, then by definition, your real estate values would rise, but your debt wouldn't rise. And so if your values went up, all of a sudden, your debt wouldn't be that expensive anymore. You wouldn't be underwater. You could sell your real estate. And of course, uh, there'd be other consequences with hyperinflation. But that would be, I would consider at this point, a black swan event. We don't know when that hyperinflation will occur. We don't know when there'll be this next unfortunate natural disaster or a man-made disaster that would cause a new migration trend where people would have to move either from another nation here or from another part of the country here. And by you know, having that kind of transition, you, you sometimes very quickly allow for absorption of real estate. So having said that this could be 2019, there is that caveat that we don't know when that exogenous external event will in fact occur. And so just like what bursts bubbles, what also bursts declines or reverses trends, are these external events that we don't know when they're going to happen. Um, just as a, an off-the-wall example, if we found an alternative fuel tomorrow, you know, an alternative form of energy that was not fossil-based, and it just changed the dynamics of, of, of oil politics and, and the oil economy, um, that could have a major impact on, on our economy and on real estate prices overnight. And so, if that kind of invention or, or, or uh, technology proved itself, that could have a major change very quickly 
uh, just like the light bulb. The light bulb changed everything. You know, harnessing electricity and, and wiring the United States changed everything. The railroad changed everything. And these things happen very quickly. And so these kinds of things can easily happen. And with that, real estate prices and the market would change also. So, you know, everything everyone's predicting is assuming things will go on exactly as they are. And I'm saying that's not going to be the case. What I'm saying at the end of the day is that things will change. Things will get better. That in America, we always get out of these, these pickles. I mean, that's what we're known for. And we're in a pickle now, okay? I mean, there's no question. I mean, that's what this election was all about. But we'll get out of this pickle, and we're going to find some way to uh, you know, bring this country back. And with that, real estate prices will get back, and people will get out of this, this funk that they're currently in. So that's my feeling. Uh, but if you are in foreclosure, what are you going to do? Okay, the, the most important thing that you're going to do, and let me see what time it is here, uh, is you're not going to rely on the government, okay? I think that's just become very apparent that you just can't rely on the government. You can't rely on government bailouts. Um, you know, maybe the government misled people, you know, and maybe that's what this election was about. But you've got to form your own bailout. And for two years, we've been saying you've got to fashion your own bailout. You know, you have to figure out how you're going to do this. You've got to hire the right professionals. You've got to do the right thing. Uh, and then you got to do it. And uh, you know, that may include a strategic default. That may include doing a short sale. That may include doing a deed in lieu of foreclosure. It may include doing a modification. It may include doing a structured foreclosure. And it may mean doing all those things and eventually going bankrupt and starting over. Uh, but that's what we do. That, that is what lawyers like, like, like myself and, and Jeff and, and Ellen and Nicole do in our office and, and other lawyers around the country is that we're helping folks figure out how to protect their rights. And at the end of the day, the foreclosure fraud crisis, in a very you know, macabre kind of weird way, plays into our hand because the bank has given us a gift. They've given us something that we can really now use as an offensive tool to help our client. And at the end, we want to, of course, protect the Constitution and we want to protect people's rights. But what we really want to do is we want a fair shake. We want to see if we can get a really good mortgage modification for you. We want to see if we can do a fair short sale. We want to see if we can make sure we can avoid a deficiency judgment. I mean, those are the things ultimately that we want to do. We want people to be able to go on with their lives and, and, and go on with their families and not have to worry about a judgment you know, tracking you around the United States or anywhere in the world for 20 years. You know, we don't want that for you. And so you know, what you have to do is, is, is come to grips with your situation and then realize that you need to strategically figure out where you're going to go and how you're going to do it. I think I am done this evening. And um, I am prepared to answer questions both from the live audience as well as from folks at home. If not, I'll keep talking. <laughs> Actually, we're coming in with some questions. Any, any questions here? I'm sure we have some. Yes. And, um, I know that you mentioned bankruptcy as an option. Right. If you have assets, what do you do when your house is, uh, uh, is, is a rental property? It's $250,000 upside down. Right. And you have assets okay. and you are trying okay. to protect those. Let me, let me re repeat the question. The question is, if you have some assets and you're upside down, what are you supposed to do? Okay. In the old days, people used to come to closing with cash, and they would, and they would, they would actually pay the difference and, and, um, and go on with their lives. I mean, that, that is what people used to do. Um, today, people are reluctant to do that because they feel that the crisis, to a large extent, was caused by the banks themselves and was caused by Wall Street, and that they don't feel that they should be, be suffering for the bonuses that have been paid to the folks on Wall Street, the bailout that was given to the folks on Wall Street, and there's this sense of, of I, I think, anger that prevents people from generally coming to a closing with a check for $150,000 or $130,000. And so the question is, what do you do? And the answer is, you get proper professional advice, and the advice will, will uh, explain to you uh, what you can legally do in terms of attempting to protect your assets. And there are things that people do. Uh, many assets are, of course, protected by their very nature. Your homestead, your home in Florida is, of course, protected, as well as most retirement assets are protected, whether it's a 401k or an IRA or a 529 account uh, or a Roth IRA or an annuity or, or life insurance. All these things are generally protected. And so with good financial planners and with good attorneys, 
you can actually structure a strategic environment that allows you to uh, possibly do a short sale or a modification in, in a way that, that will work for you and your family. Next. Yes. For online, we have, how does a lawyer get the judge to do the right thing in following the responsibilities of a judge? Well, you know, if a judge makes a bad decision, a judge can be appealed. And so the appeals that are coming down now are, are lawyers who were upset with, with the judges not following the law and not following the rules, and those judges got appealed, and those judges lost. Now, when I say those judges lost, those judges were reversed. And judges don't like being reversed. They're human beings, they have egos, and you know, once in a while you're gonna get reversed, but if you keep getting reversed, um, you, know, you don't like it. And if you keep getting reversed a lot for not following the same rules, Complaints can be made to the state about your qualification to be a judge. And then all kinds of negative repercussions can come. So, so the bottom line is the first thing is, is that, that judges can be appealed. We had situations where judges made bad decisions and we immediately appealed their decisions to the judge himself and, and laid out point blank why the judge was wrong. And, and when that happens, the judges sometimes think twice about their original opinion and, and frequently we do get the, the, the right kind of uh, response at that point in time. So the answer is you appeal. Yes, next, sir. Um, uh, we are mortgage with Bank of America and we are behind two months, evidently you have to be behind in order to initiate the short sale, the deed and all of that. And we got a notice uh, saying, you know, we want all the money up front by this deadline. If you don't do it, then we're gonna foreclose on you. Right. And by the way, we have a right to come in and inspect your home. Okay, first of all, you know, it's, it's unfortunate, but you don't get the bank's attention unless you are at least a month behind. And the reason for that, these banks are set up like the Soviet Union in the 1960s. It's a, it's a uh, just, they're, they're set up like these really balkanized kind of departments where one department does one thing and another department does something else, and they're not very efficient. And so you need to make sure you're in the right department, and that department is called loss mitigation. You only get into loss mitigation as opposed to like collections if you are at least a month behind. And then the loss mitigation guys, their job is to try and work something out with you if they can before it goes into foreclosure. So that is the point in time when you're a month, two months behind that you try and, and get a short sale or a modification or maybe a deed in lieu done. But you have to show hardship at that point. And hardship, of course, is, is a very broadly defined term. But you have to show that because of this economy, you've lost your job, Maybe someone's gotten sick, maybe there's been a divorce, maybe someone died, maybe you're not getting your overtime, someone's been laid off, you had to move. I mean, there, there are numerous hardships. A uh, child got sick, you had another child. I mean, there, there are all kinds of hardships that, you, that, that we've been able to, to, to determine. And what's interesting is a lot of times people don't know they have hardship, and when they come visit us, we're able to identify hardship in their, in their life. The only thing that's not hardship is my house is worth less than it was two or three years ago. And the reason that's not hardship is because that's uniform, that's, that's universal, okay? So hardship has to be personal to you, unique to you, and, and not across the board. But let's say you had investment property, let's say you had five or six properties, and one of the things you did is you collected rents from all your, your tenants, and all of a sudden, your tenants aren't paying, your tenants are, are moving out, and you're collecting a third of the rent, and all of a sudden, the real estate taxes go up because government doesn't want to you know, reduce the pensions from, their, from, from, from their, the, the employees that work for government. So all of a sudden, your, your taxes went up. Now your, your mortgage went up. And now all of a sudden, you're out of pocket hundreds, if not thousands of dollars per rental property. You're dipping into your IRA, your 401k. That is hardship, OK? That's hardship. Even though it's not, it, your, your price went down because you had this business, it went down. Oh, if you had a business, we had a printer. He's off by 70 80%, OK? You know? That's hardship, that's real, real hardship. And so uh, you can identify that hardship and with that hardship you can then uh, attempt to try and do, a, uh, to do some loss mitigation with, with the bank. In terms of acceleration, if you don't pay for around three or four months, they will accelerate, they send you a note saying they're accelerating the whole loan, now you, own every, you owe them everything. When that happens, you're at a point where they're, you're bringing the bank closer to you, kind of like, like Asian martial arts, they're coming closer to you, so as they're about to attack and you're bringing them in, you can attack back. And so uh, at that point in time, you ought to start seeking counsel to prepare for the possibility of being served. And the whole process of service of process is a whole lecture in and of itself, which we've talked about before, so I'm not going to bore you all tonight. But, but you all need to be schooled on, on how service of process. So I'm uh, going to leave you all with, with uh, this idea that um, 
there are lots of options. There are lots of things that, that we, we all can do. Um, it's not the worst of times. It's unusual times. Um, and we're here to help, and we're here to help you fashion your own personal bailouts to the extent you need one. Again, I am uh, Attorney Roy Oppenheim with Oppenheim Law, and I want to thank you all for coming this evening. I want to thank the folks online for also joining us tonight. Thank you very much. Good night.